So the Bible reading is on page 1011 on the Turquoise Church Bibles, reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 14. So page 1011, 1011, Mark, chapter 8, verse 14, through to verse 26. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. Thank you, Ian. Okay, now... So anybody, where do we get our bread from, boys and girls? Where does bread come from? I mean, I'm thinking you might say Sainsbury's or Tesco's or Asda. What were you going to say? Tesco's. Tesco's, there you go. Okay. Does anybody ever make bread at home? You do. Michelle, well done. So, Michelle, we have, and Damalo, you make bread at home as well. At school, brilliant. What do you need to make bread? Go on. You need flour, bread flour, strong flour, yeah. And, oh, you, oh, you make egg, you, you like, like a brioche. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. What else? Yes? Eggs. Now, that's interesting. <laughs> this is a different kind of bread. <laughs> in, <clears throat> what do you think we put in? Go on. Soldiers. You make bread into soldiers to stick in your egg. Yeah, that's a, yeah I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is what I was... I'm really thrown by the egg thing because that, <laughs> that's not what Mary Berry tells me when I make bread. But maybe that's a different recipe for bread. We use something called... Yeast. Oh, there's a, there's a loaf of bread, lovely loaf of bread. That was probably a sourdough bread, actually. And we use yeast. Do you, do you use yeast when you make bread as well as egg? If you put egg in, do you need yeast? Yeah? And you, you put the yeast as a dry powder in water, warm water, and you let it sit for a while, and it starts working. And then you mix it up with the flour in a bowl, and you knead, and you knead, and you knead. Why do you need to knead? Why do you need to knead? Yeah, tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, very good. It won't be a proper bread dough, yeah? It'll all just be one big blob or a very dry brick. I have made bread as a very dry brick, and my family said, never again. Okay, so I... I've, I've avoided bread. I can do cakes, but I can't do bread. Yeah, so we need some yeast and we need to work it. What you're doing when you're kneading is, you're, you're, as you say, you're making it stronger. The fibers are getting drawn out 
and you're making... Maybe Michelle could demonstrate for us afterwards. I don't know. This is, this is, I'm impressed by your bread-making skills. But what does the yeast then do? The yeast needs to rise. And it needs to rise before you put it in the oven. And then you knock the air out of it again. And then you put it in the oven and it goes something like that. It's fascinating to watch bread rise, isn't it? Yeah. And then if you leave it a bit longer, it'll get a lovely brown crust on the top. Look at that. Oh, is there anything better to watch? Can there, can there be any better television than bread rising in the oven? There you go. <laughs> okay. Wonderful, wonderful sight. Now, why do I say all that? Because in our story, Jesus and the disciples were in a boat. And they were sailing across the Sea of Galilee. In Mark's Gospel, they spend a lot of time sailing back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. And they only had one loaf of bread with them. So, they started saying, oh, we haven't brought enough bread. Oh dear, we've only got one loaf of bread. It sounds a bit like something that happened a little while before, doesn't it? But Jesus said to them something really strange. He said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So you need yeast to make a bread, to make bread. And he said, watch out for yeast. But not that yeast for making bread, the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about something that gets into our minds, yeah? And once it gets into your mind and changes your thinking, it changes everything. Hands up, boys and girls, anybody been to the beach so far this year, yeah? Yeah, you went to the beach, well, last year's fine. What happens when you go to the beach? You sit in the sand, you get in the sea, and then you get out and... Where is the sand? It's, it's in there. It's, it's in your toes. It's in your clothes. It's in your... You got sore legs from the sand. Yeah, absolutely. It rubs your legs and makes them sore. And it turns up in all sorts of places, doesn't it? You know, you, sand is everywhere. And you, you take your shoes out two days later and... What falls out of your shoes? The sand gets everywhere, doesn't it? It's a bit like yeast, really. <laughs> it goes everywhere. And it spreads everywhere. Now, one person gets a bad idea, and they start talking about it with their friends, and it spreads like yeast. And it gets everywhere like sand. You know, it, it kind of gets into everything, doesn't it? And it messes you up. Now, there are two lots of people here. There were the Pharisees. Or oh, let's put you a picture of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very religious. They were thought that they knew how the temple was to be run and they knew how to be properly Jewish and how to keep the law and they had lots of extra rules and they told Jesus off. They said, you're breaking the Sabbath. You kept breaking the rules. You're not good enough. Um, and uh, Jesus was saying, they're so taken up with everything they do, they got no time for God's grace. And they don't think they really need saving. Beware of thinking like the Pharisees. But there's another danger as well. Be beware of thinking like King Herod. King Herod was different. He, was, he wasn't deeply religious. He was hard-hearted. He didn't want to believe anyone. And he was saying all the time, do a sign so I can believe. Do another miracle, Jesus. Then I'll believe you. And he's all the time saying, I want another miracle. I want another sign. And people can be like that with Jesus today. They'll say, I'll only believe in you, Jesus, if you answer my questions first. If you answer all my clever problems that I've got in my mind. And so, here's a danger. On the one hand, we can think we're good religious people. On the other hand, we can fall into the trap of saying, no, I'm not going to be a Christian. I need it proved to me. And, and that sort of thinking gets in our minds and it's like yeast going through dough. It just sort of takes over and gets everywhere. You know how when you come home and you've been baking and the whole house smells of the yeast? It smells everywhere, isn't it? Or you've been baking, baking bread. When bad ideas get going, they spread, but it's not a nice smell, is it? it? It pushes us away from the gospel. So Jesus said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Don't let bad ideas take over your mind now there's a problem and the problem was the disciples of Jesus the disciples of Jesus were a bit dim and they didn't get it 
And they said, what is he saying? Now, Jesus was talking a bit in riddles, wasn't he? But they said, what is he saying? <clears throat> Beware of the feast, yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Have we not brought enough bread? Is that what he's really talking about? Is this something about bread? They still didn't fully understand who Jesus is. They didn't understand why he's come into the world. There were lots of things that they just did not understand. And so Jesus asked them lots of questions. Listen, listen to the questions that Jesus asks them in verse 17. Why are you still talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? That's a lot of questions, isn't it? Now, just think about this. What, what have I told you on a Sunday morning? It's all right, Ellen is on to her. <laughs> um, what stories have I told you in recent weeks on a Sunday morning? Uh, two big miracles involving bread. Yeah? Michelle? 5,000. There were 5,000 Jewish people. And there were how many loaves did they have? Uh, Damala? No, five, five loaves and two fish. And he took them and he divided them and they fed 5,000 people. And then there were seven loaves and they fed how many people? Seven loaves and they fed how many people? 4,000. Now, Jesus says, don't you remember? Don't you remember that I did this great miracle? And basically what he's saying is, I am enough for you. I fed all these people, but I want you to see that I'm enough for Jewish people. I'm what they're really looking for. I'm enough for all the nations. I'm what they're looking for. I gave you a meal, and the meal was a sign of saying, you're welcome. We're going to have a meal later, aren't we? And everyone is welcome. And Jesus was saying, when you come and you trust in me, you're welcome to come to God. And you're welcome to know God and be at peace with him because I've made peace through my death. We'll be thinking about that in a little while. But the disciples are sitting there saying, all these questions, what's he going on about? And Jesus asks them, do you still not understand? And the disciples are going, Oh, I don't think I understand either. Now, don't worry. I'm going to explain everything that Jesus is saying to us this morning. Really, this morning is all about puzzles. Things we don't understand and things we have to work out. Okay? So I've got a puzzle for you. It involves eight signs. What signs are they? Where do they come from? Do you know? Do you know? Have you been to London? Yeah? Parker? The London Underground. Well, some of them are both underground and overground. But there are eight stations on the London Underground. Now, why would I choose eight stations on the London Underground? Is there a secret message in there? I wonder. Well, King's Cross is in there. That's interesting. Maybe that's a big clue. Yeah? The cross is in there. Oh, and... Um, Fenchurch Street. Oh, that, can you see? There might be a puzzle in there hidden in the words. I'll leave you to stare at that for a moment, and then I'm going to take it away, and we won't come back to it till the end, all right? But there is, I promise you, a secret message hidden in all those names, and we're going to find it. Because the point I want to get across to you today is that often people come to Jesus and they say, I don't understand. I can't make sense of it. I can't see clearly. What's it all about? Some people say, oh, I don't need Jesus to die for me. And other people say, I'm, I'm too bad. He could never save me. And we sort of hold back from all sorts of reasons for coming to trust in Jesus. I'm not going to tell you the answer a bit. I'm going to be like Jesus who said to his disciples, do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? It's a puzzle, isn't it? But we'll get there. And I'll explain that uh, later. In the next part of the story, Jesus performs a miracle, of, a very strange miracle, that helps us to understand who he is and why he's come. But we'll
come to that um, in a moment. We're going to sing about Jesus now. We're going to sing a song called Meekness and Majesty, Manhood and Deity in Perfect Harmony, the Man who is God. This is the wonder of Jesus. He is God. He's God the Son become man. But he's also meekness and lowliness. He's a man and he's very normal and every day, except that he never did anything wrong. We're going to sing of the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> now, normally I have lots of pictures at this point, don't I, to tell you a Bible story, but my wonderful website that I go to, Free Bible Images, doesn't have any decent pictures of this story, so I want you to try and imagine it. I want you to imagine if you cannot see, because that's the story of the man who met Jesus. Jesus and his disciples sailed across the lake. They came to a town called Bethsaida. And the people heard Jesus had come, so they were all very excited, and they, they grabbed everybody who needed healing, and they brought them to Jesus. And one man was blind. Now, we don't know whether he, well, I think probably he had been able to see when he was younger, but his eyesight had just completely clouded up and had gone. And now he was completely blind, and these people wanted a sign so that they could believe. So they said, Jesus, here he is. We're sticking him in front of you. Heal him. Now, Jesus didn't do miracles on demand, like he's just some, some sort of, I don't know, performer in a circus. No. So he took the man and he gently led him away. I think he probably talked with him to understand his life and his story. He led him away to somewhere quiet outside the village. Do you remember that he spat... Uh, and put his, uh, spat on the man's tongue who couldn't speak. And he put his hands in his ears so the man who was deaf and dumb could speak. Well, it's the second time Jesus spits, which is interesting. He spits and presumably puts it on the man's eyes. And he puts out his hands to the man and he touches him. He touches his eyes, I think. And then Jesus said, open your eyes, do you see anything? Now this might be, I've done a few tricks with this to try and make it look different. This might be what the man saw. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> click again. It is fading in slowly, so here we go. This might be what the man saw. Hmm. It's not very clear, is it? Is that a tree? People with their arms up and they're dancing and all the rest of it. And he says, I see people, but they're like trees walking around. I can't really see very clearly. Now, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Why didn't Jesus get it right the first time? Maybe he had a purpose, a reason. We'll find out about in a moment. Then Jesus put his hands on the man a second time and he touched him. And this is what happened. Suddenly, he could see everything. It was all clear. It was amazing. He could see very, very clearly everything that he needed to see. Why do you think Jesus took two goes to make the man see clearly? Anybody have any thoughts? Did you, were you going to? No? Grace? No, you haven't got an idea. You're just putting your hands up. <laughs> I think he was teaching people an important lesson. And I think Mark records this because we need to have our eyes opened to Jesus. It was a sign of what it's like to come and trust in Jesus. For some of us, when we believe in Jesus, it isn't very clear at first. We know he's God's son, but we're not sure what that means. Uh, we know that he's very different and he lives a perfect life, but just, is he a man? Is he God? We're not sure. We're unclear. Why did he come into this world? Did he come to do miracles? Did he come to die? Did he come to do both? We get the whole thing a little bit fluffy in our thinking and we don't see clearly. It's also true that some very clever people study the Bible for their job and they never come to trust in Jesus. Maybe they work in a university and they, they study and they study for years and years and years, but they don't ever see Jesus as their personal saviour. 
They're just studying it. It's like their eyes are blind. Often, I find, grown-ups with lots of education look at Jesus and don't get it. They will not believe in Jesus. But children who don't think, I'm amazing, I'm great, I'm very important, and I'm cleverer than everybody else. Children who come humbly to Jesus, or, or adults who learn to become children in their heart, do come to see who Jesus is. They do come to realize who he is and why he's come into the world. Some people see, but other people are blind. Which kind of person are you? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you looking at what he did? Can you see who Jesus is? Now, I've got a, another puzzle for you. Well, two, actually. When you look at this photo, how many faces can you see? How many, how many, Parker? Two? Two in the back row? Yeah, two. Now screw your eyes up. Screw your eyes up really tight and look at the girl on the left. Can you see a third person? And some people are getting, I'm hearing some murmurs. Oh, you're yeah, getting it. Screw your eyes up really tight like that and just look. And can you see a pale face on the left? If you can't, I'll help you. Just there. Now, just take it away and see. Can you see? There's a face there. Mm. Ah, isn't the internet amazing? <laughs> Somebody showed me that on Facebook, and I thought, I've got to pinch that for when I preach on this. Uh, there's a face there, just two eyebrows and a nose. and just There's a mouth on a jumper all of a sudden, isn't there? If you just go blurry in your eyes, you can see. Just by looking, you can... And some of you are sitting there saying, what on earth are they going on about? I can't see that at all. Here's another one. How many faces can you see? Can you see a beautiful face there? Yeah? She's turned her head away, hasn't she? How many faces, Parker? Just one, okay. You've got one, yeah? So you've got a beautiful face, she's turned her head away. Or has she? Maybe, maybe there's another face there. Yeah? Can you see? Oh, a scary face, actually. She looks, mm, yeah. Um, I wonder whether they painted it for the first face and then discovered there was a second one there after they painted it. I don't know. But uh, there's just something a bit, a bit scary about that face. Oh, anyway, there you go. That's kept you occupied, hasn't it? Yeah. Now, some people say, I can't see that. I won't bother. Some people say, oh, I don't know what you're on about. Can't see it. And some people do that with Jesus. They think about the claims of Jesus a little bit. They read the Bible a little bit because their friend says, why don't you listen to this? They come to a carol service maybe and listen to the readings we read at Christmas. But they don't really listen to Jesus. They don't really pay attention to what he's saying. And we need to look carefully at what he did. He did great miracles, but they are signs pointing us to something bigger. And what he's really come to do. And sometimes it's like the man that he healed who was blind. Sometimes we just see men like trees walking around. We see it's all blurry and it's all foggy and we can't make sense of it. And we need to listen carefully to what Jesus says to explain to us who he is and why he's come into the world. And we need to think about how we need to surrender to him as our Lord. How we need to be saved. How we need a new beginning and new life. That's what his disciples needed to do. And we're going to find out about that in a moment. As we think about what Jesus then said to his disciples. Because it's very, very important. Now, we've got a song. Um, One thing I know that Christ has healed me. Though I was blind... Yet now I see. That's what every Christian says, isn't it? I get it now. Now that I've come to trust in Jesus, it's wonderful. It changes my whole life. Though I was blind, yet now I see. This has got a lovely rippling tune to sing along to. We have sung it before. Let's, let's have a go and see if we can. So this reading starts where we left off the last time. It's on page 1012 in the church Bibles. 1012 reading Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 33, page 1012. 
Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Jesus has this big, big question for his disciples. Who do people say I am? Now, that's a very important question, isn't it? Lots of different people have tried to explain who Jesus is. If he could do great miracles, well, we need to understand who he is. We need to understand what he's done. Um, and we need to understand uh, what to make of him. Jesus spoke in a way that nobody else did. When Jesus preached... Everybody listened. And uh, he spoke with a, a power that you had to listen to. Who is Jesus was one of the big questions. So some people said, um, he's John the Baptist. Do we remember the story of John the Baptist a few weeks ago? John met a very sad end, didn't he? He was taken into his cell and they cut his head off. But people said, oh, maybe although John died, he's come back from the dead. And Jesus is John the Baptist, come back from the dead. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Other people said, Jesus is the prophet Elijah. There's a some strange character there. He's being fed by ravens during a drought. Um, one day I must tell you the whole story of the prophet Elijah. It's a great story. And the prophet Elijah didn't die. He was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind. Maybe he's come back. Because there was a promise that somebody like Elijah would come back. So they're thinking about all these things. But then Jesus asked them the big question. Who do you say I am? Am I just the little man from Nazareth? You know, the carpenter's son. Or am I something much more? Jesus is saying to his disciples, are you seeing clearly now? Are you really understanding? Are you like the blind man who I healed? And actually, he could only just see dimly. It was all fuzzy and, and, and strange, and he couldn't really see. It was like looking through a cloud. Or are you seeing clearly? Do you fail to get it, or are you seeing clearly? Now, this is the extraordinary thing. Peter, who was the one who liked to shout and jump about and say things off the top of his head, a bit like me, Peter said something extraordinary that nobody expected him to say. He said, you are the Christ. That's who you are. And that's true. Jesus has come to be the Christ, the Messiah. It means anointed one or chosen one. You remember that when the king was crowned in Westminster Abbey, he was anointed with oil. Well, that's to show that he was a chosen king. Jesus is a much greater king than that. He's been called by God to leave heaven as the son of God and become a man to enter our world, to become our king and to rule over us. You see, we rebelled against God. We said we don't want God in our lives. We want to live our lives our way. And Jesus comes to call us to turn away from our sin and to follow him and to become part of his new kingdom. Now, Peter thought, oh, that means Jesus will ride into Jerusalem and he'll take over and he'll set up his new palace and he'll be a powerful king with a great army and will drive out the Romans and I want to be part of it. Oh no. 
That is not what Jesus meant. Jesus had a big shock for them. Yeah, he's a little man, a bit like a pawn on a chessboard, who's really a king. I love that photo. I don't know who took it. But this is really what he's come to do. He's come to die on a cross. And that's really puzzling, isn't it? Because the day that Jesus was crucified, they would look at him on his cross and they would say, what kind of a king is he? You know, the soldiers would mock him and put a crown of thorns on his head. And it would seem, wouldn't it, that when Jesus died, it was finished. It was all over for Jesus. You know, he, whatever he came to do, it's finished, it's gone, it's done. He's, 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 he's over, he's dead. That's it. But listen to the words of Jesus. And this is what the disciples couldn't understand. Look at verse 31 if you've got a Bible open. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that is Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And you notice that little word must. This is the work that Jesus must do. He's come to do it. He must suffer. He must die in the place of sinners so that our sin is punished in his death. And if we come and trust in him as our king, as our savior, our sin is placed on him at the cross. And everything he's done, which is perfectly good and righteous and, and perfect, that becomes ours. So God looks at us and he sees Jesus and he looks at Jesus and sees our sin and punishes it at the cross. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, you need to be ready for the day when I am crucified, when I die in your place. But listen, he must be killed and after three days rise again. I'll gain the victory over death. It won't be the end. I will be your king. I will gain the victory over death. And then your eyes will be really opened. Now, who's been thinking about my puzzle? Lots of people don't have their eyes opened at this point. but um, There's my puzzle, okay? What? It's, what? Okay, you're getting there. Let's go, let's go sign by sign, shall we? What? I'm going to get some words out of each sign, okay? What words could I get out of the first sign, Mansion House? Parker? Mm, I could, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Yeah. In fact, this is really hard. Damalo? Let's have a look, shall we? They're not all there, all right? <laughs> And, and that was the hardest, okay? Jesus is the Son of Man. What that means is he's come from heaven and he deserves all the glory of heaven, but he's come to the lowest place, even death on a cross. So he's come to die on King's Cross, yes? King's Cross is the place where Jesus died. No, not King's Cross in London, but the cross of Jesus the King in Jerusalem is where he died. Um, King's Cross is named after another king. And not a good one, so we'll pass over that. The people who crucified Jesus put a sign up saying, Jesus, King of the Jews, didn't they? Making a mockery of him, laughing at him. But actually it was the cross of a king, for he did die in our place. And where did they take him after the cross? Where did they take his body to? Dunlo? It's up there on the third one. Damalo? Well, before the cave, the cave was in a Covent Garden. It wasn't in Covent Garden. It was, it was in a garden, wasn't it? <laughs> Can you see where I'm going with this now? Yeah, it was in a garden. And what did they do? They, what would Kingsbury be about? They buried him. They buried the king, didn't they? Hence Kingsbury. Okay, so the Son of Man died on a king's cross. They buried him in a garden. That's half the story, isn't it? Why do we go to Kensal Rise, do you think? He rose. He rose from the dead. Yes, that's right. In fact, he rose from the dead Victoria? No, 
victorious, in victory. There we go. Okay, he rose in victory. These are somewhat tenuous, these connections, but uh, please bear with me. Now, those of you who know, you know, all right, so I had to include Mornington Crescent. If you don't understand why, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> uh, he rose on Easter morning. Yeah. And it wasn't just Easter morning. It was the best of all mornings, wasn't it? It was, it was like the whole world had been heading into night. The whole world had been heading into darkness. And now Jesus rose from the dead and made all of life like morning. Because the night is gone and the morning has come. And the gathering darkness of Good Friday, when everything seemed finished, has now been turned over and it's morning and the sun is rising. The sunshine of God's presence is rising for the Son of God has risen from the dead. And why have we got Fenchurch Street at the end, do you think? Anybody? Church. Yeah. That's right. Because Jesus rising from the dead created his church. People turn from their sin and trust in Christ. He gives us new life and a new beginning. We turn our back on our old way of life and we have a new beginning. He tells us as his disciples, we've got to take up our cross and follow him. Got to be willing to suffer to follow him and be known as a Christian. And for every Christian, when we get that, when we get that story and see what it's all about, we can say, I can see clearly now. That's our theme for today, isn't it? Suddenly, we can see clearly Jesus for who he truly is. He's alive. He's powerful. He can save anyone, whatever we've done, who comes to trust in him, however broken our life is. And the puzzle begins to make sense. Now we've made sense of Jesus, we make sense of life. Have you come to put your trust in Jesus, to see him clearly for who he is, the Son of God, the Christ, the Savior, the King, that we must come and put our trust in? Praise God for all that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to sing, uh, before we come to pray, turn your eyes.